All right. Dear all, a warm welcome to all colleagues and friends of the International Crisis Group, and welcome to all those who keep connecting as we talk to join this event. We sincerely appreciate that you are here with us today, unfortunately still in virtual presence only, uh, taking the time to join us at an intense moment for the conflicts and crisis situations that we all uh, work on. My name is Giuseppe Fama, and I'm the head of EU Affairs at Crisis Group. Before introducing this morning's event, uh, for those who are not familiar with our work, please allow me to briefly tell you who we are. Crisis Group is an independent organization working to prevent wars and shape policies that can build sustained peace. Our mandate is to engage with all parties and support efforts to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent and deadly conflict. We do so by sounding the alarm bell, providing independent field-based and high-quality analysis, and engaging directly with conflict actors and key international players, like many of you in this event are, to encourage informed and intelligent action for peace. And indeed, this is what we aim to do this morning as well, discussing what are the drivers of the rising tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean, what are the stakes at play, and how to strengthen peace prospects uh, across the region. The whole Mediterranean has been one of the crucial junctions of humankind. Migration, uh, trade, political and cultural exchanges made it one of the most prosperous areas for world history. It has also been uh, the crossroads of competing interests and of the ambitions of regional and global powers, including those not far from its own borders. Shows of naval power, security dilemmas of all kinds, threats and outright wars have tormented the past of this region. We may say the same about the recent past and, and, and about the present too. The Eastern Mediterranean remains a vital junction for human and economic flows across Europe, Asia and Africa. In Africa, but the region is again the theater of several crises, very much intertwined uh, among themselves, uh, which compose a multi layered and complex reality. Geopolitics continue to divide the island of Cyprus, which is an EU member state. The rivalry between Greece and Turkey has also made the area a dense spot for naval exercises and military buildups uh, of all kinds. More and more migrants continue to attempt reaching Europe to escape hardship from Syria and other fragile contexts, and most recently, Several discoveries of natural gas and the internationalization of the Libyan civil war are the new causes of friction. Along with internal political shifts, these developments prompted a new escalation between Turkey and its neighbors, particularly Greece and Cyprus, which reached uh, dramatic peaks. Most notably in summer last year, when Greek and, and, Cypriot, uh, uh, and, and Turkish vessels came into close contact on, on two occasions. Although both sides held their positions, tensions decreased progressively, uh, and Turkey and Greece have returned to talks, but the situation is very far from being on a stable track to resolve any of the layers building this complex crisis. The European Union, among all actors, is particularly confronted by the dilemma of how to balance incentives and disincentives, protecting the interests of its own member states, but also avoiding to alienate a necessary partner for the European Union, as it is Turkey. Let me use this privilege, indeed, of introducing our event to stress the exceptionality of the situation as seen from Brussels. The Greek Turkish standoff combines the EU's internal dimension with questions around the soul searching of its own foreign policy. It challenges the EU's energy strategy and brings in the internal competition between national players too. It also raises uh, competing views among EU member states on the EU's common foreign security policy, especially when we look at the implications this crisis has in other conflicts in the region, uh, uh, such as Libya. This is why this event is indeed part of a series of activities that we address primarily to the European Union and the European policy community. This crisis talk, as we call it, is part of an ongoing collaboration with the European Union that helps us strengthen the Union's conflict analysis, early warning capacity, and deliver them policy advice on how to intervene to prevent, mitigate, and possibly resolve violent conflict. And so I wish to acknowledge the partnership with the European Commission through the instrument contributing to stability and peace, and the very strong collaboration with the European External Action Service, which enables all of this work. Um, therefore, this crisis talk uh, 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 will devote particular attention to European actors, but also expand our view to other regional players and the United States too. Uh, as we uh, continue convening in this uh, virtual format, we can also benefit from the participation of many colleagues from the region and, and across Europe. A little less than 100 colleagues are joining the call, for this debate, including uh, policy practitioners, uh, regional experts and diplomats working on peace and security from the EU and its member states, as well as colleagues from civil society, journalists and international organizations elsewhere. Uh, plenty more will be also watching this event live through our channels. Uh, and indeed, this event is on the record and live streamed by our website and our YouTube channel. 
for those uh, uh, joining via these platforms or social media, uh, you can interact uh, uh, with questions and comments in the YouTube page, and we encourage you to animate the discussion also on Twitter and other social media using the hashtag crisis talks. This crisis talk will be structured in one single section, in one single session, but we will make sure to integrate at least three dimensions. First of all, we will uh, address uh, different perspectives from uh, Ankara and, uh, um, and Athens. Uh, secondly, we will look at the, um, um, as, as a second pillar, at the regional setting of this competition, particularly looking at the energy dimension. And a third pillar will address the EU and US roles and interest in the Eastern Mediterranean. And of course, we will devote about a third of our time to a Q&A with our participants, either in the school or in other platforms. I very much look forward to the panel discussion. I'm sure it will enrich not only our understanding, but also the array of options to consider in order to avoid a new escalation in the region. Uh, and now let me introduce you, the colleague who will guide us for this exchange, uh, Hugh Pope, who is Crisis Group's Director of Communication and Outreach. Hugh holds this position since 2015, leading the overall planning, organization, and direction of Crisis Group's communications. Uh, to build up crisis group public face, impact, and support for uh, conflict prevention. But there is more, because for 10 years, uh, 10 years before that, uh, Hugh was crisis group deputy uh, program director for Europe and Central Asia, and most importantly, a crisis group uh, project director for Turkey and Cyprus, before other colleagues took over the role of being our leading minds, uh, presence, and voices uh, on this crisis. I sincerely hope that this exchange between our colleagues and guests will help strengthen our action in the crisis situations we will discuss today. And let me also thank uh, all uh, of you again who uh, connected uh, with us. I wish you all a very productive exchange. Dear Hugh, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks Giuseppe for the kind introduction. And it's, uh, it's great to be back with this topic, which is very dear to my heart uh, after all those years we spent together on it. And uh, as Giuseppe mentioned, we're going to do this in three parts with the excellent speakers just waiting to, to join us. Uh, I, I will say just one extra thing about the format of the talk is that we will have a, 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 something called a Slido um, uh, uh, system for a, putting your questions. You'll see it on the YouTube channel. Uh, you can vote, uh, you can vote the um, uh, vote your uh, questions up, the ones that you want to see, and uh, we will then put them to the panelists when they finish their presentations. As Giuseppe mentioned, we're going to do this in three phases. The first looking at Athens and Ankara and Turkey, Greece. Uh, the second looking at the more regional context. And the third uh, looking at the, uh, the, the, the actual hydrocarbon aspect of it. And here we're very lucky to be joined by Charles Elinas from the Republic of Cyprus. Um, and that will come at the end. So uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's go to the first stage uh, of, our, uh, 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 of our panel today. Um, we're going to talk to Berkay Mandirija, our analyst for Turkey, who joined us in 2015 in uh, uh, our, uh, our office in, in Istanbul. He comes from uh, an NGO background in Turkey and for us has also covered things like the, uh, the conflict in Turkey's southeast with the Kurdistan Workers' Party and also the return of ISIS. And so uh, luckily the uh, East Mediterranean issues are, are much less um, uh, dangerous currently. But uh, I think uh, I'll start by putting the same question to, to both uh, our, 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 our panelists for this session, which include uh, Yanis Grovioridis, who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, but Berkay, first to you, um, we saw some really grave tensions in 2019 and 2020, some of the worst we'd seen for many decades, actually, uh, with Ankara sending seismic ships into waters contested, not just with Greece and the Republic, but also the Republic of Cyprus and, uh, uh, and uh, delineating maritime boundaries far further than ever before. Um, since the beginning of this year, we've seen talks start between Ankara and Athens. We've seen a more conciliatory approach, apparently, from Ankara. Um, what can just tell us what do you think the risks are should these uh, talks break down again? Thank you very much, you, um, and thank you also for the question. Uh, so, I mean, we have been looking at the sort of East Med uh, issues from the Libya prism. We started and we did this in two thousand and twenty, 
Uh, we moved on to write this report on Turkey Greece, as you said, which and I will go into more detail uh, during my speech. Our Middle East colleagues are also looking into sort of the regional energy dimension. And um, we are also now working on a report on Cyprus, on the Cyprus dispute, um, which is also going to be on our agenda. So uh, a lot of new outputs on, in the pipeline from our side, um, but um, so much for self-promotion. I think uh, Giuseppe already covered that quite well. Um, you know, what I want to do to answer your question uh, is to look at sort of the interrelated dynamics behind, you know, Ankara's turn towards a more muscular approach in 2020. What were the reasons behind that? Uh, and what is the rationale behind sort of the, the recent turn um, towards the escalation and sort of mending ties with, with adversaries? Um, and finally, sort of also go a bit into the recommendations we have on Turkey, Greece, and, you know, also maybe conclude with a few points on Cyprus. So first, you know, how, how did we get here? I think um, there are a number of interrelated reasons. Um, first of all, hydrocarbon resources uh, that were found in 2011, that, were, that picked up in 2018, 19, and a sense of exclusion uh, of Turkey and Turkish Cypriots from these energy designs led to a major concern and major frustration on part of Ankara. Um, and it rendered it more urgent for Turkey to do something um, to respond to uh, this isolation that it was perceiving. Um, uh, of course, the non-resolution of the Cyprus dispute and grievances that have built up around uh, the, the fact that Cyprus has remained unresolved for so many years, despite you know, the 2004 Annan plan uh, and uh, Turkish Cypriot support and Greek Cypriot, uh, um, 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 Cypriots voting against the Annan plan at, at the time, sort of starting the history from there has been something that we have been hearing a lot from Turkish officials as one of the main grievances that have been built up around Cyprus. And of course, this, all of this came at a time when Turkey's relations with the EU and the US uh, became much more sour. And I think there are, these are sort of the con contextual reasons that we also need to keep in mind. Um, the relations, its relations with uh, you know, other countries that have a stake in the East Med also deteriorated, particularly following the Arab Spring you know, Turkey's backing of Muslim Brotherhood and affiliates, you know, it strained and actually ruptured ties with Egypt. Uh, relations became much more difficult with Israel. And Greece was really able to stack up support from these countries, capitalizing on Turkey's, you know, deteriorating ties with them. So essentially, you know, from Turkey's perspective, um, there were two blocks of countries converged against it in the East Med scene, which uh, prompted it to uh, respond in the way that it did. And then there were also shifts in domestic politics in Turkey, quite significant shifts actually. The coup attempt in uh, July 2016 in Turkey was an important turning point. You know, nationalists both aligned with the president and opposed to him were pushing for a more hardline stance and also the foreign policy realm. And they blamed the government for you know, what they saw, saw as Turkey's foreign policy failures, saying you know, these were a result of you know, two compromising policy positions that did not serve Turkey's interests, you know, be it towards the EU, be it on Cyprus, uh, also normalization attempts with Armenia, all of uh, which um, 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 came to naught. And of course, this came at a time when sort of um, the, the president of the ruling party started losing some support and opinion polls. And, you know, there was an attempt to keep fragile alli alliances with nationalists, uh, with the Nationalist Party actually afloat, both in the bureaucracy and the parliament. So in a sense, there was a convergence of interests between the nationalist forces in Turkey and the ruling party, which reflected on uh, foreign policy choices. So what we have seen, sort of the dominant narrative in Turkish politics for a while now, has been that there is an orchestrated attempt to contain Turkey's geostrategic reach, um, and uh, you know, that Turkey needs to push back against such efforts, you know, including, if needed, via military means. Um, and this line also gets a lot of buy-in from segments that do not support the ruling party. So there's a wide spectrum of support for, for such policy uh, positions. So in a sense, we've seen sort of this Turkey's projection of hard power in an attempt to raise the stakes uh, and sort of also to increase the cost for other states that it feels are ganging up against it and trying to strengthen it, its hands in prospective or existing negotiation uh, tables, be it in Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, uh, bilateral relations. And, you know, there were a number of ways in which Turkey responded to this. There was the maritime delimitation agreement that it struck with Libya in 2019. Uh, the main reason for that um, was to sort of respond to um, sort of the uh, contest maximalist Greek claims. 
in the stretch of the East Med you can see uh, on the map. Thank you for projecting that. Um, and um, there was also an intention to complicate efforts to sort of uh, build an East Med gas pipeline that would run from the East Med sort of to through uh, the areas delimited between Turkey and Libya and onto Europe. Um, and then, as you already said, Hugh, you know, there were all these attempts about seismic research vessels, vessels being sent to um, Cypriot claimed and uh, Greece claimed uh, waters 2019-20 when tensions uh, uh, were rising. And of course, one thing we shouldn't, uh, we should also should keep in mind is there was also at the same time, we saw that Turkey and Turkish Cypriots increasingly started voicing their preference for a two-state solution on Cyprus, you know, calling for a solution that should be based on, you know, equal sovereignty, um, rather than a bizonal bicommunal federation formula. Um, I, I guess we can discuss and how far that, uh, that, that is realistic or not. But, uh, you know, the, the, it was part of the response that Turkey and uh, to, in sync with the new Turkish Cypriot leadership were giving to the sense of, you know, isolation um, um, from, from, East Net, from East Net affairs or East Net uh, energy designs. And then finally, we had a softening of tone. Uh, uh, you know, there was a pivot of Ankara towards intense diplomacy on the Turkey-Greece track, but also on, on Cyprus, informal talks, and um, uh, also other attempts sort of to mend ties with uh, Gulf countries, but also with Egypt to sort of peel off, as we say in our report, support that Greece and Cyprus are getting from, from these countries and for other uh, interest-related reasons. So how, how to explain this pivot towards the West and other adversaries, I think, on the Turkey Greece track, Ankara saw that it could not afford more brinkmanship due to its economic fragility. Turkey really needs to mend ties with the West for, you know, not least for investor confidence. Um, there was a threat of EU sanctions, which probably also played a role, and it, it could have been um, sort of affecting, uh, could have affected the economy uh, even more. Also, in some ways, you know, some of Turkey's adversaries began throwing their support behind Greece and the Republic of Cyprus even more than they did before when tensions were high. So, you know, Greek diplomacy and sort of galvanizing the EU and especially France and other countries who support it also showed that there were some limits of this assertive um, policy approach. And then, you know, there was a realization that, you know, there was not much more Turkey could gain from showing military muscle. And hence the push for relaunching talks with Greece. Uh, I think that was sort of the rationale behind Ankara and sort of going back to talks. Um, uh, the international context has also been shifting, which I think also played a role. And Alisa will talk about that more. Um, but I just wanted to mention that you know Turkey is trying to profile itself more sort of as a geostrategically useful country for the West and also within NATO. Uh, we saw this recently in discussions around Afghanistan. Um, Turkey's role in uh, potentially securing the Kabul airport, uh, to some extent also, you know, when tensions rose with Ukraine. So there is sort of a, and, and there is a normalization process, of course, ongoing uh, between Gulf countries, Israel, Iran, and Turkey is concerned about uh, being an outlier in the region or being excluded from these new regional emergent designs, which uh, also sort of uh, pushes Ankara and the, uh, Turkey, the Ankara leadership more towards uh, diplomacy and uh, diplomatic, uh, like investing in uh, diplomacy right now. But that, I mean, you know, that does not really mean that Ankara is ready for substantive compromises at the moment. Um, any sort of concessions, especially on, you know, maritime sovereignty claims are very unpopular um, 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 right now. And probably, you know, it's similar in Greece. Uh, I'm sure Ioannis will talk about that more. But uh, you know, opposition parties vying for national support are even pushing for a harsher stance on some of these files. Um, and you know, we are approaching 2023 uh, uh, election cycle in 2023, where you know the main, the key voters will be nationalists, and you know, the opposition parties will be vying for that as well. So you know, concept, there is really very little room, and even maybe not not any room for um, significant concessions, compromises at the moment. But still, uh, we believe you know, it's important to capitalize on both sides' willingness to talk, um, Turkey's and Greece's uh, willingness to talk and strengthening dialogue channels. You know, one helpful step that we identified in the report is to sort of a recommitment to CBMs that have been elaborated in the past. Uh, we are still seeing now text announcements every now and then by both sides. Military drills are ongoing in the Aegean Sea. Uh, we also recently saw tensions between the two countries' coast guards you know, migration is becoming a tense issue still, it still uh, remains a tense issue, both at the land border, but also in the Aegean Sea. 
uh, you know, around alleged pushbacks, etc. Uh, so it would be important for the sites to sort of recommit to uh, military CBMs um, and where you know needed to expand them. Of course, there is a channel that is sort of uh, the Turkey Greece military to military talks on CBMs have been revitalized recently. So hopefully they can lead to some concrete outcomes soon because uh, it's important for the for those those CBMs are important because they can reduce the risk of accidents turning into bigger escalation. And you know we've seen in the history of the Aegean dispute that this uh, has been the case in the past. And then you know the uh, two other aspects, um, the sort of addressing Turkey's sense of isolation. We've sort of uh, looked into that as well. And, and I guess, you know, in the end, sort of overcoming opposition of members of the East Med Gas Forum to sort of Turkey's inclusion would be an important step. Of course, there's still some way to go um, in that direction. Um, but, and whether this will actually uh, move forward will also depend on whether Turkey can norm normalize ties with Egypt, Israel, France in particular. But that's uh, an area sort of to address this isolation that Turkey and Turkish Cypriots are uh, expressing. Um, and on the sort of on the EU dimension, I think that's uh, I wanted to note that, that as well, the positive agenda that we have on the table, sort of modernizing the customs union, um, new funds for Syrian refugees, which will be coming. Um, these are all very important agenda items for, for, for Ankara from uh, a Turkish perspective. But I mean, of course, the money that will come in for refugees is also very critical for the, for the well-being of millions of refugees Turkey is uh, generously hosting. Um, and you know their vulnerability has increased during the pandemic, so that's uh, definitely uh, important. And I think these areas, uh, both the customs union uh, modernization and uh, cooperation with refugees, are all positive in terms of potentially in the future opening up channels for more cooperation between Turkey and EU when things are more conducive. And finally, on Cyprus, uh, there are two. Just one. I mean, we've you know started looking into the Cyprus question uh, more deeply recently. But I think there are two sort of areas to look out for, um, you know, whether there any common ground emerges between Greek and Turkish Cypriots to move from the five plus one informal talks to formal negotiations. The sides still seem quite far apart as it stands um, and sort of a breakdown of these contacts, of course, could trigger uh, could, could be a trigger for more tensions. And I think sort of UN efforts in this regard um, um, should be um, should be watched and there will probably be uh, more meetings in September coming up. And then I think there's also this question on Cyprus, especially, you know, what can be done irrespective of a path to settlement? You know, what can we do while the sides are searching for common ground? Um, and this will also depend on whether there's, uh, you know, a willingness emerging on the Greek and Turkish Cypriot side um, to agree to progress on sort of uh, uh, negotiations to stabilize sort of the island and the situation in the East Met, especially you know, on issues such as Varosha, gas revenue sharing, steps to ease the isolation of the North. But I mean, I'm you know, these are sort of steps that can be explored that could be could could, could bring some positive momentum um, into the Cyprus discussion. But I would be curious to hear more views on this from the panelists and the audience. Uh, maybe I'll leave it at that, um, and I already look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Berkai. That was a. a, a seeing a, a relatively benign uh, answer to the risks. I'm very interested to see um, what our next speaker will, will, will have to say. Uh, Yanis Grigoriadis comes from a glittering array of academic and research institutions in Colombia, in Oxford, and Berlin, but he's best known to all of us for being able to straddle the Aegean Sea. He uh, has bases in both Turkey and Greece and is respected and, and admired in, on both sides, which is a very rare achievement and is currently holding chair, uh, the Jean Monnet Chair of European Studies in a Turkish university, Bill Kent University, and is also a research fellow in Athens at Eliamet. Um, Yanis, welcome uh, to, to our panel. Um, you heard Berkai give a, a fairly um, a description of the fragilities, but on the whole, seeing a, a, a benign course for the at least the short term. Uh, do you think that the, 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 the risks are great of the talks breaking down and us going back to the the tensions we saw in 2019, 2020, or would you join back in saying that mostly things seem to be set fair? I thank you very much here for the very generous introduction. Thanks to the International Crisis Group for having me here this morning. I would join this uh, uh, slight optimism in the sense that uh, I think that the latest meeting of the two leaders went well. So the meeting of Mitsotakis and Erdogan in Brussels in the context of the NATO summit went, uh, 
better than expected by many experts. And I think that this uh, healed one of the most important issues in the context of deteriorating relations of the two countries over the last two years, which was the lack of a personal a relationship, a good personal relationship at the, and the channel of communication between the two leaderships. I think that this hurt a lot of the relationship at the time when things were going bad, there was no way to stop them from becoming worse. And there have been a lot of issues that really hurt the bilateral relationships over the last two years. And uh, as you said in the beginning, it's, it hasn't been as bad for decades since this Helsinki December 1999, the Sinti decision that named Turkey as a candidate state. We've seen the crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean in last summer, but we've also seen the refugee crisis on the Greek Turkey border, which was another very important event, which was interpreted in Greece by many It's a hybrid attack by Turkey against Greek sovereignty, because it really stressed uh, the Greek government position and also sort of uh, raised a lot of concerns about the nature of the relationship between the two countries. And of course, as Berkay mentioned, this uh, signature of the Libyan Turkey uh, memorandum back in November of uh, 20, uh, 2019, if I remember well, uh, this agreement also uh, opened the Pandora's box regarding the maritime disputes between the two countries. This was an issue that was shelved for many, many years. The two sides had agreed to disagree, but no side took action in uh, putting its position forward against the other. So, by taking this position, Turkey uh, moved uh, the dispute back into the mid 90s, like when the Emir Karda crisis took place, when the two countries would dispute sovereignty and sovereignty rights over maritime zones. And uh, uh, I would like to make this interesting connection because I think that there is something that we can tell this, uh, uh, we can figure out out of this. Uh, the people who were influential back then uh, in the mid 90s, the, these admirals and these uh, military officers that were behind the drive of uh, Turkey's putting a number of multilateralist claims against Greece and against the international uh, law of the sea or the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, were the same people that were advising the Turkish government in the last few years. And I refer to the like the authors of the so called Blue Homeland Doctrine that became again relevant for Turkish foreign policy as a result of a number of developments in Turkey and the failed coup attempt and the recovery and the, of some of the offices that were removed by uh, the Erdogan government in the first years of its administration. And they joined again the government alliance under the circumstances, of course, of the post 2015 uh, Turkish uh, coalition government, which is the AK Party and MHP with the AK Party taking a very different attitude on foreign and security policy issues uh, compared to the past. What was the, the irony of the situation was that Erdogan used to be criticized and Berkay said, I think put it correctly, that many of the opposition seem to agree with what uh, the Turkish government has been doing over the last years because they used to accuse Erdogan for being too soft on Greece or on the Greek Turkish dispute or on Cyprus. And uh, now that the Turkish government shifted to that position, they appear to be uh, arguing that the Turkish government came to our position or to our national position. Of course, uh, this was matched with a much more unilateralist and, and militaristic attitude of Turkey. Turkey intervened in Syria, intervened in Libya, and uh, attempted to project itself as a power that is not bound by its Western political and military alliances. And this, of course, was a very alarming uh, issue for many neighbors in the region, including the countries that eventually came closer to Greece. So in that respect, Greece's uh, success in signing an exclusive economic zone agreement with Italy first and Egypt, most importantly, second, had to do with the fact that Turkey had become enormously isolated in the region. And this is independent of what Greece did. So Turkey was isolated for its own policy reasons and failures, maybe, in the region. And then the Greek government was simply able to reap the benefit of this and was able to sign an agreement with Egypt that, uh, on the one hand, came closer to the Greek position. But on the other hand, if you look into the map, and Berkay's map highlighted this, Greece was willing to agree on a line that didn't uh, agree on the principle of equidistance between uh, Crete and the Egyptian coast. 
it wasn't 50-50%, uh, it was slightly tilted towards the Greek side. So uh, the Greek government showed flexibility in that respect, and this was understood by the international community. At the time, Turkey was making the most maximalist of all claims, i.e. arguing that it shares a common maritime border with Libya. So in that respect, I think the Greek position was became stronger diplomatically internationally, and Greece was able to benefit from the stronger support of France and a number of other international actors that uh, highlighted that was, what Turkey was doing in the Eastern Mediterranean was really undermining regional security. And of course, there was an instrument on the table to, uh, to uh, de-escalate and reduce tension, which was the resumption of exploratory talks that was taking place for many, many years between the two sides. The exploratory talks was a part of the Helsinki structure. The Helsinki decision of December 1999, it introduced a mechanism that would hopefully lead to the resolution of the Cyprus question by 2004. Unfortunately, it didn't happen as we know, but also tried to frame the maritime dispute between Greece and Turkey in a way that there are some exploratory talks between the two sides. And in the case that these talks fail, then the two sides agreed to re refer the case to the International Court of Justice, which would make a decision binding for both sides. So again, this opportunity was lost in 2004. Exploratory talks continued for some years. They were interrupted again, interestingly, in 2016. And then since then, the two countries had no channel of communication. And there was no diplomatic uh, way to exchange views and uh, prevent the escalation of uh, tensions and disputes. So like issuing NAFTEXs, for example, or making all sorts of unilateral moves. So this is how we came to this extremely dangerous situation of last summer, which I don't think was uh, due to what the Greek government was intending. The Greek government was definitely not intending into getting into this, but it had to respond because what Turkey appeared to be doing was make sovereignty claims on an area that was also disputed by, uh, claimed by Greece. So the Greek government appeared compelled to, to make some moves there to claim that we have rights here and this is our sovereignty. Uh, we have sovereignty rights in this region as well. I would like also to conclude my brief statement. I don't want to take more time so we can have more discussion by referring to the Cyprus question. The Cyprus question has been poisoning uh, developments in Greek Turkish relations and in the Eastern Mediterranean overall. I think that the missed opportunity Karl Montana, whereby until Karl Montana, somebody could hope that natural gas discoveries could become a conflict resolution catalyst in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, because natural gas would provide some additional funds because the solution of the Cyprus problem would cost money and uh, nobody would like to put the bill. And uh, if uh, there was a natural gas bounty, that would be very, very good. Unfortunately, the Cyprus uh, problem swallowed the natural gas discovery. So the natural gas discoveries amplified the disputes because now we had the issue of Turkey's Cypriot representation or the fact that Turkey doesn't recognize the Republic of Cyprus unlike the rest of the world. And all this adds to a complexity of a problem already complex uh, and uh, unsolved for many, many years. So in that respect, my understanding was that uh, the, the Turkish government attributed uh, at least some of the responsibility for the failure of the Cyprus talks to the Greek government. So in that respect, they didn't understand maybe projecting the relationship between uh, Turkey Cypriots and Turkey uh, on the relationship between uh, the Republic of Cyprus and Greece. They consider that the Greek government is equally responsible for the failure, at least from the Ankara point of view, of, of the peace talks in Kramontana. Montana. So they moved into a more unilateralist, attitude and the more maximalist or aggressive attitude, this time infringing upon Greek rights, so not Cypriot rights. And this is how we came to this situation. So in that respect, any international attempt to, to revive the peace talks in Cyprus along the internationally recognized uh, framework would be more than welcome. I, I recognize very much uh, what Berkai said, that there is a new government in the North that has been taking now the uh, like by two-state solution as the priority, and which as which, which, that's of course another discussion topic. We cannot solve it now. I don't think it would be a viable solution, even though BBF by the Black Union Federation might be a difficult solution to achieve. A two-state solution may have a lot of other issues to address before becoming a reality. So I wouldn't support that. 
but there are some issues to, uh, to work on. For example, all this news about upcoming Varosha developments that is going to really poison the relationship, opening the Varosha ghost city to development, or sort of uh, destroying the existing derelict uh, properties of Greek Cypriots in order to build all sorts of uh, hotel projects or, I don't know, other new housing projects in this area is going to really make uh, conflict resolution in Cyprus even more difficult than it is today. So I would like to uh, call for some action in that respect so that we don't get worse in Cyprus and at least we can maintain the already uh, difficult ground we have. Thank you. Thanks, Yanis. Uh, thanks for keeping to time too. That there were lots of uh, issues that you've raised that I look forward to coming back to in the questions. This whole issue of Turkey's blue homeland policy, whether these personal relationships that you mentioned are really managing to restore proper communications, uh, and of course also the, the the issue that you refer to that Cyprus before. Uh, 2000, say, used to be a, a fairly uh, niche interest. It was basically Athens, Nicosia, and, and Ankara. And uh, ever since uh, Cyprus joined the EU, it became an EU problem with Turkey on the outside, sort of Turkey negotiating to join, so half in, but half out. Uh, and the circle of interest growing with the, or accelerated perhaps by the, the hydrocarbon issues of bringing in the East Mediterranean. And so with that, I think I'll move to the next phase of our discussion. Um, and uh, here, I, here I'll bring in uh, Alyssa de Carbonell, who is uh, Crisis Group's uh, Deputy Program Director for Europe and Central Asia, um, but is thoroughly familiar with all these issues of, of, of Europe's uh, security as uh, a, a reporter who covered Europe's uh, security for, for Reuters News Agency for many years, and uh, has also been on the front lines of many active, uh, active wars as a, as, a, as, a, as a reporter before then. Um, Alyssa, you, 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 you've, you've heard how this, this, uh, this uh, dispute uh, over um, Cyprus and then the hydrocarbons and then the Aegean has kind of expanded to bring in other players. Um, can you just give us an overview of, uh, of how the geopolitics of, of the situation is uh, uh, affecting the situation and whether you would agree that, uh, as Yanis and Berkai have so far uh, laid out, that there is, there is a slight reason for hope that the, the short term, at least, is, is uh, less risky than it was a couple of years ago? Yeah, thanks, Hugh. Um, so I do, I do think that's a good question. We've heard a lot already, so, um, you know, but I think, you know, uh, it, maybe it wasn't the worst crisis of the last 50 years, you know, in this periodic escalation between Turkey and, and Greece, but it was certainly the most protracted uh, crisis to date. And I think a lot of that has to do with the geopolitical shifts um, since then. I mean, um, we've heard a bit from Berkay and Ranis uh, definitely about, you know, more in the detail about how this, this bilateral dispute has kind of morphed over time to encompass um, this wider knot of issues um, and how the positions of the two make it even like tougher to entangle right now um, um, with some of the domestic uh, politics that uh, Berkay and Ranis were talking about in Turkey also. Um, but I mean, I do think there is, um, you know, hope limited opportunity now um, for a more stable de-escalation, let's put it that way, not to resolve the problems per se, but to kind of move more, um, as we put it in the report, from brinkmanship to dialogue. And, and, and thankfully we are um, a long way off from where we were last summer, um, thanks to the summits last month and this decision to have um, direct contact between Mitsotakis and Erdogan um, to deal with these issues. So I think, you know, the first thing was already mentioned on um, is, is Turkey's more assertive foreign policy and the reaction to it. Um, the fact that it's become more increasingly isolated um, and that has pushed uh, sort of rivals to, um, to back uh, Greece um, more openly. You know, I think this domino effect that Johannes spoke about of the Turkey-Libya agreement leading to um, you know, partial agreements um, or, or, dis or ways to, to move forward with Italy, Egypt, and Albania um, on, on Greece's disputes there, uh, maritime disputes there is, is significant and also on the military front, obviously. Greece has um, ramped up its exercises with allies um, as a deterrent. Um, so, you know, we see this ongoing 
despite the de-escalation and, and just last week, you know, from the other side of things, we had news that, you know, 30 Qatari fighter jets are going to be conducting training exercises in Turkey, which is kind of, you know, can be seen as a response, but I didn't be interested in other people's views on this, um, to um, the Greek Air Force's purchase of French uh, Hafid fighter jets and military co cooperation with the likes of Israel, UAE, Saudi Arabia. Um, so I do think there is hope for optimism, nevertheless, because the mid Texas administration has other priorities, um, and um, and there is this diplomatic um, effort by uh, Turkey to break its isolation. Again, um, I mean, at least from the EU um, uh, perspective, um, there's a lot of skepticism there about whether this is a sustainable de-escalation um, and whether Turkey won't just send out drill ships again. So I think, you know, we can get that into that a little bit more in the discussion, but in the, in the big picture, the other issue, which of course we're going to go more into depth uh, on in the next uh, sort of presentations is, is gas. Um, and I think, you know, the dispute isn't per se about gas, but obviously those discoveries aggravated, aggravated tensions. But I think what's worth noting there is, you know, that, um, the sort of the idea, um, um, which has been very much supported by the EU and the US, um, that uh, forums like the East Med Gas Forum um, could be a, a, a vehicle towards cooperation in a region and that gas um, and economic cooperation could lead to, um, to uh, at least a reduction of tensions um, and, and better bilateral uh, multilateral cooperation in the region. But at least from Turkey's perspective, this, um, you know, the MGF has um, sort of turned from an energy forum to a loose uh, security framework that, you know, really overlaps with other Middle Eastern disputes. Um, and France has just no joined now, but also, you know, other excluded actors like Lebanon, uh, you know, don't see this forum as, as a kind of a, a purely economic gas uh, cooperation forum any longer. Um, but, you know, there is also some hopeful lines there um, to, to stay in the more positive, optimistic aspect of things. Um, you know, I do think that Turkey's discovery of more gas in the Black Sea should provide some relief um, to the Turkish economy. Um, it should go some way to easing sort of desires for energy independence. Um, there's already been a reduction in dependence on Russian gas um, in Turkey um, in recent months and years. Um, and these developments also coincide with uh, a pretty radical shifts in the uh, energy market, which I'm sure um, Charles Elianes will speak a bit more about. Um, but turning to international actors and institutions, um, you know, many of the uh, officials and diplomats that we spoke to for our latest report felt that sort of the ebb of US engagement in the region was a factor in last year's um, escalation. Um, I think that's up for debate, but certainly the US has strengthened its relationship with Greece in a number of dimensions in recent years. And this is driven, including by the desire to sort of pry loose Russia's energy grips from the Balkans and other, other factors that don't really have to do with this dispute. But in any case, you know, it's clear that Turkey's repositioning itself with respect to the US since Biden came into office. Uh, and that means including um, in, in the East Med, um, but you know, by, this is by far not the most important bilateral issue for both, but these are you know, helpful developments in this context. Um, and then you know, just to touch on some of the, I mean, the, the, the other actors from a European angle, um, well, NATO has obviously been an important mediator in the past. And Berkai spoke about some of the um, confidence building measures, uh, military to military sort of, um, the, the framework that has been put in place to uh, for the militaries on both sides to exercise restraint. And that, you know, was brokered in large part by NATO in the past um, after previous uh, cycles of escalation. Um, they haven't played such um, a critical role at the moment. There was, uh, there was a very important um, sort of moment in the fall when NATO did um, encourage these efforts. Um, but I think it's important to, you know, to remember that um, Turkey remains an active and critical partner in NATO operations. Um, I mean, you see that with the F-16 fighter jets just sent to Poland, um, you know, uh, to think about sort of the wider sort of picture of these things. And obviously at the NATO summit last month, we saw the importance of these kind of meetings on the sideline um, that have 
allowed for a reduction of tension, that have allowed for dialogue to go forward. And again, this direct channel of communication rather than um, what we saw. So, you know, sort of last but not least in the in the geopolitics, I mean, Berkai again touched on this, uh, Ankara's sort of dim prospects for EU accession or dimming prospects for EU accession um, has removed, you know, one of the moderating factors in Turkish and Greek policy alike. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's also where we stand now. We kind of see an EU approach that um, teeters between extremes. It's, you know, the signaling for of the, of the potential for interest-based cooperation, but also, you know, threatening uh, sanctions and, and restrictive measures. Um, and the, you know, the tensions over migration since 2016 have had a big influence on, e on the EU's response to Turkey over other issues. Um, you know, Turkey is no longer as satisfied, perhaps, as it was at the time when the 2016 migrant deal was brokered, um, and both sides saw that as sort of relatively fair. Um, you know, Turkey has been less satisfied um, with that deal over time. Um, you know, there's questions over disbursement of funds and whatnot. Um, but, you know, Johannes mentioned how important the migrant crisis was in Greece's thinking um, and reaction to this. Um, and now, you know, when you talk about EU policy, I guess the cynical view from, uh, from Athens and Cyprus is that EU, um, each EU member state has its own sort of interest driving its response to Turkish ships flying waters near Greece or Cyprus. And it has little to do with solidarity. Um, in any case, we can see that German efforts to mediate um, last summer were kind of hamstrung by these EU divisions over the right approach to Turkey. Um, but there are other tensions there, if we're quite honest. Um, you know, Germany was, uh, was in a very good position to mediate at the time and has sort of uh, important bilateral relationships with both actors. Um, but things like the sale of German subs to Turkey um, and other issues are sort of uh, a strain in the Greek uh, Berlin relationship, though I'd be interested in, in Ioannis's and other people's thoughts on this. I mean, France has obviously taken the most unambiguous line in support of Greece. Uh, Rome has been hedging between Turkey and the EMGF bloc. Um, Britain's absence has also sort of shifted the EU internal dynamics. Um, and then there's this wider fragmentation that we kind of discussed a little bit um, of the EU's eastern and southern neighborhoods. Um, on the one hand, the Baltic and eastern states who are much more concerned about Russia. And you see that um, also in Poland's purchase of, of, of Turkish drones, um, um, which was the first sort of a NATO uh, member states to do so, and um, and on the other hand, sort of southern states that are more concerned about Libya and migration. Um, but I mean, to strike a more hopeful note, I think you know French, Italian, German positions have more recently converged around um, you know the approach to Turkey. At least we've seen a consistent approach in the last EU councils um, with kind of this very careful language. Um, so I don't know, I've raised a bunch of issues, but that's the sort of the wider context of actors looking at the situation from abroad and the fact, the things that factor in. So maybe I'll stop there. Thank you, Alyssa. You've, uh, you've managed to summarize an immensely complicated uh, situation extremely clearly. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's always difficult to know what to recommend when there are so many small policies that need to be somehow corralled like sheep towards a goal. Um, but uh, uh, we'll look forward to asking you more questions about that in, in a moment. Um, and for our next stage of, uh, of the discussion, uh, we have two panelists who uh, can deepen our knowledge in two directions. One, uh, the first I'm going to turn to is uh, Charles Linus, but we will also uh, be turning to Riccardo Fabiani, uh, who will possibly give us a bit more, uh, uh, both on the energy and the North African dimension. Um, so Charles Linus is, uh, well known to, to all of us for when the, um, the, the, the gas, the, the, the offshore gas issue um, uh, burst onto the, uh, the, the, the Turkey-Greece stage. And uh, uh, he, he is now a non-resident senior fellow with Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. But uh, back in 2011, he was uh, uh, the, the CEO of the Republic of Cyprus's Cypriot National Hydrocarbon Company. And he was an extraordinarily uh, eloquent uh, uh, 
supporter of the uh, of the dream uh, of the, the, the gas then represented for Cyprus. It was uh, those were heady days, which uh, I'd be interested to hear your reflections on. But um, obviously. Uh, 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 tempered by 35 years of experience in the uh, oil and gas sector. So Charles, uh, t t tell us, um, uh, is it, you know, you, you've, you've seen all the ambitions that Cyprus had, and uh, I guess uh, slightly less, uh, less than they were, um, and uh, Ankara also uh, still talking about becoming an, uh, an energy hub. Um, how, do you, how, how real is all this energy? I mean, we've heard about how the, 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 temp, the, the prospect of all these riches has driven so much of the tensions and the, 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 the ambitions of the various players, but is it real? And uh, do you, where do you see it going? Thanks, <coughs> Thanks you. Um, the answer is simple. It's uh, surreal. <laughs> you know, away from reality into dreams. And, uh, and perceptions. I mean, Cyprus had an opportunity back in 2012 or 13 to take the gas situation further. That has gone, it didn't take it, it's gone. And it's a bit like what uh, was said earlier on by Onis about uh, the solution to the Cyprus problem. Opportunities come, they are missed and they never come back again. And this is a problem. And, and Turkey's uh, aspiration to become an energy hub is, is a dream as well. I mean, with Europe's shift to green energy and away from natural gas, the idea that Turkey could become an energy hub um, for Europe was never credible and has since been overtaken by events. Turkey is a gas transit country, but not a hub. Uh, not, um, for example, a CTF is in the Netherlands, uh, and with Botas being a monopoly, it cannot become a hub. So let's skip that aside and go into the realities. In order to understand the future of uh, natural gas resources in the EastMed, we must first understand the fate of gas and gas prices globally, because often our friends and colleagues in the region concentrate on the region, lose sight of what is happening in the world. And gas is not a local commodity, it's a global commodity. And whatever happens in this met is dictated by developments elsewhere. Most um, major economies have committed to net zero by 2050. This leads to an inevitable shift towards clean energy at the expense of fossil fuels. And it's happening and it's happening fast and it's not going to be stopped. The EU is at the forefront of this shift uh, through its Green Deal and its commitment to achieve a 55% cut in emissions by 2030 um, on the way to net zero emissions by 2050. And as you can see from the graph, According to the European Commission, this requires unabated gas consumption to decline by about a third by 2030 and become marginal by 2050. So how is the EU going to um, need more gas? And how is, uh, is, is the EU going to encourage this met to produce more gas? It doesn't need it. This is supported also by the International Energy Agency that in, in its uh, roadmap to net zero by 2050, published in, uh, in May, is calling time on the fossil fuel industry. It's calling for a stop to new oil and gas exploration by, by mid 2020s, if the world is to achieve net zero by 2050. According to the IEA, L LNG exports, uh, next slide please, will um, peak this decade and decline thereafter. And you can see there what I, IEA is, is uh, envisaging. I don't believe that it's going to happen in the same way, but something like that is bound to happen. LNG exports will peak and then will come down. That will challenge East Met's expectations to export its gas to Asia as LNG. If LNG demand so is going to start com coming down somewhere sometime this decade, or maybe even early the next decade. How can that justify developing East Med gas as LNG to, for exports to Asia? A, a, a gas project needs, needs five to seven years to develop, and it, and it also needs 20 years life to recoup the investment. So we're talking about um, 
these projects being alive and exporting at full capacity well into the 40s. How is that going to happen with this potential uh, reduction in demand? It, it's not feasible. In Europe, gas is facing an existential crisis as a result of new climate policies that are now affecting investment in new natural gas projects and plants. The world's largest banks and investment institutions are committing to a low carbon future. It is fast becoming a case of not just peak oil, but also peak oil investment, peak oil and gas investment. Where is the investment going to come from to sustain these projects? The OECs, the international oil companies, are now being forced to adjust and operate in this new high, highly challenging environment. It creates a huge problem for all the international oil companies and financing of new projects. Listed oil company capital expenditure, as you can see from the graph, uh, was about 360 billion in 2014. It came down to 200 billion in 2019, and it is now down to 140 billion and going uh, even lower. This, is, this cannot sustain project activity uh, to pre-COVID-19 levels. The trend for IOCs will be contraction to core regions and larger projects with less appetite to take new areas. This brings challenges to the development of the ISMED. Not only ISMED gas is expensive to develop and get to global markets, but the recent, the recent regional turmoil is caused by a belligerent, a belligerent Turkey, the Libyan instability and the lingering uh, maritime disputes and the Israel-Lebanon dispute and so on may be becoming too challenging for the troubled IOCs to tackle. They have other areas to concentrate. Take ExxonMobil, has huge discoveries of oil, about uh, 10, 10 billion barrels in Guyana, much easier to develop. Why should they be bothering about the ISMED? Uh, as operations, exploration and production in the ISMED are led by the IOCs, and we depend on these. We don't depend on national oil companies. We don't have them. We depend on the IOCs. These developments are bound to affect future investments and plans substantially in the ISMED. The region needs to wake up uh, to this fast evolving situation and adjust accordingly, but I'm afraid that is not happening. Apart from the fast shift, shifting situation, gas is not the main driver of Turkey's actions in this map, but the pretext. And let me explain. The geological likelihood of finding hydrocarbons in the areas of the East Med Turkey has been exploring or drilling is small. So far, it has drilled eight wells without any credible results. And it's not going to have any credible results. In addition, Turkey, driven by energy security concerns and balance of payments, has been prioritizing domestic energy production, renewables, hydro, coal, and now nuclear, and is now um, going to develop its own gas in the Black Sea at the expense of energy imports. So Turkey increased domestic energy production to 30% of the total energy it uses. And it has now diversified uh, gas imports by bringing in floating uh, storage and uh, regasification units that allow it to import LNG from the spot market, buying from where it's possible. Last year, 20% of um, gas of uh, Turkey's gas came through these FSRUs. That's diversification. This gives credence to the view that Turkey's aggressive actions in the ISMED over the last few years are not energy driven, particularly in the areas it claims to be part of its continental shelf, having such low probability of gas presence. The drivers behind these actions are geopolitical, pursue of maritime control and probably hegemony in the ISMED. But I leave it to other colleagues who concentrate on geopolitics to explain that. Last year, it appeared that President Erdogan preferred to maintain disputes as a distraction to divert internal opinion in Turkey from the increasing problems within the country uh, due to his worsening economy. But the economic situation has now become dismal. 
mostly as a result of his own actions. His belligerence may have been tempered by the realization that he needs the EU and the US on his side. The confrontation is going to help him. After all, the EU is Turkey's main commercial partner and the US is likely to take a dim view if the confrontations of the 2020 are repeated. This time around, the new US administration is working more closely with the EU on matters relating to Turkey, the East Med and the wider region. The EU's uh, approach with US support, is strictly, if strictly maintained, could help offering Turkey incentives for meaningful cooperation, but also maintaining the threat of sanctions should Turkey revert back to aggression and confrontation. In its dire economic state, and it's getting worse as we talk, Turkey has much to gain by engaging constructively and cooperating with you and much to lose if not. Essential to this is the escalation of tension in this met through continuation of the cessation of illegal drilling activities and continuation of bilateral talks between Greece and Turkey. In particular, Turkey must refrain from further unilateral actions in violation of international law. EZ and continental um, shelf limitation disputes should be addressed through dialogue under international law. And then probably say more about this later on during the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. It was uh, really useful to see the, the your, your dose of realism there about what's really happening in the markets and what can really be done. And I especially liked your, your comment about doing a deal when it's possible to make a deal because uh, these opportunities do come and go. Mm. Um, so thank you for that. Now we'll turn to our last speaker, to Ricardo, uh, who is our uh, Crisis Group's North Africa Project Director uh, and overseeing our work in Egypt, Libya, Tunisia and Algeria, all countries which are uh, literal countries to the, the, the Mediterranean Sea and have now become involved in this East Mediterranean drama to, to greater or lesser extent. It'll be fascinating to hear uh, what he has to say about that, bringing uh, experience that he had uh, before joining us in, in energy consultancies and uh, policy consultancies. Um, and so how, how real is the, uh, the, the uh, North African involvement in, in all the issues we've been discussing? Uh, are they aware of the realities that, uh, that Charles just outlined to us? Thank you, Hugh. Um, I think uh, when we talk about the Eastern Mediterranean, inevitably we are talking about um, a very real, I would say, regional rivalry between Egypt uh, and Turkey. Egypt has sort of emerged over the years as the main almost antagonist or rival to Turkey's interests uh, in relation to the development of the East Mediterranean gas resources, but not only, right? We know that uh, Egypt and Turkey have obviously competed and are still competing uh, over other uh, geopolitical regional issues uh, of great relevance to both countries, such as Libya, but obviously also the role of political Islam uh, in the region. And Cairo has sort of, I would say, uh, tried to position itself as an alternative, right? Of offering an alternative vision uh, uh, on all of these issues, and particularly on the East Mediterranean. Uh, and in doing so, it has been supported by a growing group of uh, regional allies, if we can call them uh, that way. Uh, from the beginning, we could say that Egypt has really aimed to become the indispensable or unavoidable regional gas hub uh, for uh, the development uh, of these resources. And one of the I would say key uh, elements that it has tried to exploit was also its, uh, what we can call its first mover advantage. Uh, Egypt was one of the first countries to develop and bring online its offshore natural gas resources. It has pre-existing gas uh, infrastructure uh, that it can use obviously in order to become a regional hub. And most importantly, it has diplomatic ties across the area that often not always, of course, but often, uh, I would say, cross uh, regional cleavages. For example, Egypt obviously has uh, permanent relations with Israel, uh, among others. And in all of this, I would say Egypt has really uh, emerged as the driving force behind the East Mediterranean gas war, uh, 
uh, as we know. It, which obviously, you know, as Alisa was saying already, it has been presented as a technical institution meant to handle the cross-border aspects uh, of these resources and various other technical issues. But in reality, it, it has really become a geopolitically charged entity. And if we look, you know, just a simple look at the membership of this body is sufficient to understand this reality, right? We have Cyprus, Egypt, France, Greece, uh, Jordan, uh, Italy, uh, as permanent members, but then we have Lebanon, Syria, and most importantly Turkey outside of these organizations. And one of the European countries that is obviously a member to this, uh, uh, to this group is actually France, which is geographically hard to consider as belonging to the East, the Eastern Mediterranean. So inevitably, I would say the growing tensions between Turkey on the one hand and many of the forum members uh, on the other hand, have really weighed heavily uh, on this situation and, and on this uh, on this uh, group, of course. And over the past years, we have seen a kind of a consolidation of a loose coalition of Mediterranean states, more or less all driven by their opposition to Turkey's role and Turkey's interests in the region. And Egypt has really been at the forefront uh, of this camp. Uh, it has really reinforced over the past few years its diplomatic and military ties with France, Greece, Cyprus, and the UAE, which is also, by the way, uh, an observer to the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum. Uh, and this really, for example, has meant that, uh, you know, just to give an example, in, in May this year, Cairo bought 30 fighter jets in Rafale from France, uh, or that over the past months we have seen uh, what almost appeared like an endless series of military drills in the Mediterranean in which these countries uh, all took part and that were all ostensibly, I would say, aimed against uh, you know, Turkey or possible to clash with, uh, with Ankara. So uh, in all of this, obviously, you know, there, there's been this, I would say, consolidation of, of interests uh, or uh, or of an alliance almost against Turkey. And on the other hand, obviously, we've seen, as uh, you know, Berkay and Alisa were already explaining, Ankara's reaction to this growing uh, isolation. And one of the key, I would say, developments, and probably uh, uh, the key development in all of this, has been Turkey's direct military involvement in the Libyan conflict. That took place, that began in between December 2019 and January 2020. As we know, officially on the uh, invitation of the Tripoli government, which at the time was desperately fighting against uh, Khalifa Haftar's forces that were in the, on the outskirts of the Libyan capital and they were about to topple the, uh, uh, the Tripoli government, which, by the way, was at the time the internationally recognized executive. So uh, on the invitation of, uh, of, the, of, the, Turkey, of the Libyan uh, government, Turkey began to send a vast amount of military supplies, its own troops, advisors to halt this offensive, and most importantly, to preempt the defeat of the, of the Western, Western Libyan government. And this operation was extremely important because on the one hand, obviously, it marked the spectacular reversal of the Libyan conflict, of the dynamics in the Libyan conflict. Uh, it, you know, from, we went from uh, uh, an almost victory, uh, uh, almost done victory for Haftar and its regional allies, so Egypt and the UAE, to an almost, uh, you know, almost a defeat for them. Uh, but what is important, and it's not just the dynamic inside the Libyan conflict, but also what came with this uh, support. And maybe here we can bring up the slide that was uh, shown before uh, during Berkay's presentation on the delimitation of maritime borders, because Turkey here used this operation, that, so the support it brought to the Tripoli government, at the same time to strong arm the Tripoli government uh, to accept a treaty that defined the international maritime border between Libya and Turkey. But this definition of the maritime border was suddenly in open contradiction with other agreements and other interpretations that the other Eastern Mediterranean countries had previously either signed or, or, or promoted. So this agreement really came as the price that the Tripoli government had to accept, had to pay for its own survival, for this, for this intervention that really uh, managed to, to, to avoid uh, its, its own defeat. 
And we know from Libyan sources that the prime minister at the time, Siraj, was actually very reluctant to sign this deal, which, by the way, has not yet been ratified by the Libyan parliament. It was, reluct it was reluctant because it, was it, had, it had inevitable domestic and regional ramifications. And at the same time, again, the, the, the overlapping of these two crises continued because as Turkey uh, continued to uh, basically to, to back and support the counteroffensive inside Libya, uh, this began to trigger alarm bells in Egypt. And it was in the summer of 2020 that uh, many of us remember that President Sisi declared that the front line uh, in central Libya, in the area of Sirte, was for Egypt a red line. If Turkey and the pro Tripoli forces crossed that line, Cairo threatened to intervene directly inside Libya. So, for several weeks, the risk of a direct clash, direct confrontation between Egypt and Turkey in Libya uh, was quite of a, a real, I would say, risk. So, we can now uh, uh, move on. And um, the showdown, you know, as we know, never happened uh, inside Libya because the US uh, and Germany in particular mediated between these two countries and convinced Ankara to halt its counteroffensive in central Libya. But what is very, I would say, fascinating uh, right now, particularly with the benefit of hindsight, is that given all this history, given the tension and the rivalry between Egypt and Turkey, the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean, and then, then what happened in Libya, it is almost counterintuitive now to highlight that it's precisely that military intervention by Turkey that indirectly paved the way for a renewed push for negotiations at the beginning of the transition in Libya on the one hand, but also the beginning of a gradual, even though it's yet you know, still unfinished, reconciliation, potential reconciliation between Egypt and Turkey. So why, why am I saying this? Because Cairo and Ankara have you know, began to talk Right before, uh, right after the, uh, the the risk of a of a clash in Libya effectively uh, subsided, initially only at the military intelligence level, and initially only to focus on their diverg divergences in Libya. But this sort of low level dialogue between Egypt and Turkey was one of the factors that really enabled the beginning of the transition in Libya, the the, the current transition that has been then uh, brought forward by by the UN. And from that dialogue, Turkey has actually taken the initiative of trying to resume a more formal and diplomatic conversation with, uh, with Egypt. And Egypt, as we know, was actually reluctant uh, at the beginning and wasn't really interested in that. But over the past months, we have seen Ankara trying to almost win over Egypt, but most importantly, trying to close this diplomatic gap between the two countries. Uh, and in May, there was a Turkish delegation led by the foreign minister visiting Cairo, which was obviously the first you know, high profile visit of this kind between the two countries. And now the two countries are talking about exchanging ambassadors again. Now, this is all obviously great and encouraging, but it's also important to highlight that there is a, still a series of outstanding issues that separates Turkey uh, and Egypt. And most importantly, the issue of the presence in Turkey of, you know, several Egyptians affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood who are effectively in exile. Uh, in Turkey and Egypt wants, uh, wants them to, to, to try them. Uh, and then there is the issue obviously of Ankara's military presence in Libya, which is un still unclear when it will end, when Turkey will decide to withdraw its forces uh, from Libya. So I would say this is, you know, there is a potential reconciliation here, which could have obviously, you know, reperca important repercussions for the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, but Egypt, it's important to remember, Egypt is in no rush to normalize its ties with Turkey. From the Egyptian pers perspective, Cairo is in a position of strength. It wants first to extract concessions from Ankara before even considering Turkey's demands. And Turkey's demands obviously have not yet been fully articulated at this stage, but we know that they are related to the Eastern Mediterranean gas issue, the definition of the maritime border, where Egyptian officials have already uh, signaled that they are willing to talk, to discuss uh, with the Turks. And you know, there's many people claiming that actually Turkish and Egyptian interests when it comes to the definition of the maritime border are not necessarily uh, uh, contradictory. There's actually a possibility for an arrangement, for a mutually beneficial arrangement at the same time. 
But at the same time, it's the Egyptians know very well that there is limited flexibility that they can offer on this issue because it has an impact on the other Eastern Mediterranean countries and states that with which obviously Cairo has excellent relations that have been uh, uh, reinforced and strengthened over the years. So, so there is a willingness, a certain willingness to find uh, an arrangement, but there are also very clear, I would say, limitations and very, I would say, the, uh, uh, the very uh, difficult demands to meet for Turkey uh, on the other hand. Obviously, again, this is obviously a positive development, you know, from a regional perspective in terms of stability. But again, it's difficult to gauge at this moment how far this reconciliation can go. And it's, uh, I think, important to remain cautious about uh, its potential impact. It's something to encourage. It's something that has uh, a positive repercussions, but it's also something that needs to be monitored carefully over, over time without uh, falling into the trap of uh, becoming overly enthusiastic uh, uh, about this. Um, I'll stop here, Hugh, and uh, so we can continue this conversation. Thanks. It has been a fascinating hour hearing all these different perspectives uh, put out so so uh, eloquently. Um, we have a box on the YouTube channel for asking questions. Uh, participants on Zoom obviously can also put questions to our distinguished guests and panelists uh, there. And while you're thinking about what you may ask, because I'm not seeing that yet, um, uh, I will just actually start by turning to Berkai with, you know, uh, it seems that uh, sometimes listening to everybody that Turkey's at the center of it all, um, but at the same time, supposedly isolated. It, you know, the one, one moment, no one, no one wants to have anything to do with Turkey. At the other moment, uh, it seems that all roads are leading to, to Ankara. Uh, how, how is it? How is the situation being read in Turkey? Uh, is Ankara comfortable the way things are? Uh, is it moving on to other partners? Does it think it's got everything balanced nicely? Uh, is there more that it wants from a convergence with the EU? The, 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 the negotiations to join the, the bloc seem to be completely frozen, but is there, is there more that it can do in a transactional way? Uh, could it just patch up with Egypt and go back to its old, uh, its old idea of being a regional leader? Um, or uh, will it just continue in what uh, one of its leaders used to call Splendid isolation. I mean, well, how, how is Ankara reading the situation, Berkai? Thank you, Hugh. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, I think we are in a situation where, you know, Ankara has realized that sort of uh, it's deteriorated by bilateral relations with a number of countries are not serving its interest anymore. And um, that realization, of course, has uh, prompted sort of new attempts to break out of that isolation. And, you know, increasingly, we're also seeing this sense of, you know, becoming more strategically autonomous. Strategic autonomy is coming up very often in the debates um, here in Turkey, but also sort of um, in general is expressed a lot um, by Turkish officials that reflects on sort of the uh, uh, defense industry, but also to, you know, uh, on steps uh, elsewhere. So I think there is a sort of an attempt to do that. Um, and of course, you know, Turkey has historically always been balancing the West with uh, Russia. And that's sort of one of the key, key points I think that we also need to look out for, because um, it's sort of as Turkey's relations with the West deteriorated and Turkey found itself more, um, um, you know, Russia actually increased its leverage on Turkey on a number of fronts, and that has made it more difficult for Turkey to balance ties with the West, obviously S four hundreds and 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 all all the other issues uh, played into that. So I think right now we are sort of in. Uh, a transition phase in Turkish foreign policy, uh, where we are seeing both sort of a balancing um, um, and uh, a sort of attempt to break out of this isolation and redefining Turkish foreign policy in a more strategically autonomous way. I mean, not in the way that we saw potentially in the 90s, where Turkey would be a reliable NATO member, which again, I guess, is, is part of the policy in general. But I think it goes a bit beyond that. Also, you know, Turkey becoming more of, uh, of an autonomous actor in foreign policy, trying to redefine and sort of re, uh, let's say, delimit its uh, area of operation in foreign policy, uh, in, the for in foreign policy, mostly um, in, in ways that uh, will serve, serve, serve its, its interests. So I think we have been seeing that um, uh, sort of four, three or four things going in parallel. 
um, keeping the balance, but still redefining um, the limits that Turkey can push in terms of strategic aut autonomy. And I guess sort of the sense of, you know, um, a, a, a withdrawal, let's say, or um, a lesser engagement of the US in this region um, has also played into that because in the past Turkey would see sort of its alliance would see more benefits from, from its um, you know, strong alliance with the US and, and within NATO, whereas recently that has uh, shifted more and you know, the US is not seen as a reliable actor as, uh, as less reliable, let's say, compared to the past. And I think that has also um, um, brought up the need to become more strategically autonomous and think about new ways of engaging with uh, re actors in the region. Thanks, Berkay. Yes, strategic autonomy. Yeah, I, I, by the way, I don't think the 1990s were, we saw a Turkey that was obedient uh, either. I mean, there's a word to the Western will. I remember our constant uh, clashes with the United States over NATO issues and so forth. But uh, Yanis, if I could turn to you while everyone is thinking up their, their questions uh, to our, uh, our panelists, please don't be shy. They are, they are eager to, to, to answer all, all, all that you may ask them. Uh, but Yanis, you've 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 heard about the strategic autonomy. Where do, where do you think Turkey fits in? How do you how do you think uh, uh, everyone can get to a place where they are comfortable with each other? Is that is that a realistic uh, uh, prospect? Well, I think what is really at stake here is to understand that when we talk about an autonomous actor, we're talking about an actor who is defining its policy according to a certain set of rules and norms. And this is the problem here for Turkey, I think. And maybe that's the issue that the Greek approach and what has been going on in the Eastern Mediterranean has uh, been trying to put forward. The idea is that we need to have a relationship which is rules-based and not a purely cynical transactional relationship, whereby Turkey is trying to strike one-to-one -one deals with certain countries or trying to promote its interests in a, in, a, in a realist point of view. The European Union doesn't operate or doesn't want to operate on that environment. So there is international law, there are international organizations that try to pave the ground for the resolution of international disputes. And this, I think, is one of the key questions. It's a preliminary question to answer before we enter into the discussion of resolving such issues. So in that respect, we can think of the resolution of the international disputes in the Eastern Mediterranean within a greater international legal framework. There are some legal instruments and there are some UN conventions on this. So I think that from the European Union or from the Greek point of view, it will be very important for Turkey to pledge that they will agree in principle that the international law is going to be the framework for the resolution of disputes. Of course, all countries have legitimate interests and Turkey is one of them, but other countries have too. So finding the, the golden line that kind of reconciles our interests would be the most important point. Otherwise, that could be quite difficult and it would be a relationship that has been recently developing in some ways. We can say, for example, that many critics in the European Union looked into the refugee deal between EU and Turkey as a very cynical transactional deal, whereby both sides were able to get something, but international norms suffered. And in light of this, of course, we cannot escape looking into the domestic situation in the country, where the rule of law in Turkey goes, or where freedoms go. Because over the years, over the decades, that was one of the most important uh, things to expect from the improvement of EU-Turkey relations, that democratization in Turkey would develop. And uh, Turkey's ranking in freedoms or human rights international uh, lists would improve. And uh, it is an important discussion to have within the European Union, you know, whether we've given up completely with this and we're trying to engage with Turkey on a different level or we're, whether we think that this is still something worth pursuing. And addressing some of the disputes between EU member states and Turkey or the European Union as a whole in Turkey would be very important in that respect. So many moving parts. We have a question from Harvey Carroll Jr. who's asking about uh, Libya as well, another piece of the puzzle to, to, to put in. And uh, Ricardo, I guess this one is for you there. He's asking really who's in charge. And I would just add to that, uh, does the change that we've seen in Libya you referred to Prime Minister Siraj's uh, reluctance to sign that uh, that very sort of almost historic uh, deal, uh, even if unratified, on 
the maritime delimitation with Turkey. Does the new government that's come in mean that uh, Turkey's losing losing out there now? Is there a, is there a change? Is there, do you think this is a, a, a seismic shift? I think it's uh, one of the real key the features or issues uh, in the current Libyan transition is uh, exactly that. So who exactly, which of the international and regional powers uh, that are present and influential in Libya has more control or more influence over, uh, over this government? And most importantly, uh, what is Turkey's position in all of this in the, in the transition and how do they see this obviously going forward? And it's, you know, first of all, we have to go back to the, uh, the, the genesis and the birth of this government. This government was a little bit of a surprise. It came out of a very complicated uh, internal the negotiation process with a, a very complex election uh, 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 procedure that eventually produced a government that was a surprise to everyone, it was not really what Turkey or Egypt or the UAE were really uh, trying to get. Uh, uh, as part of this uh, uh, negotiation process, but they all, all these different regional powers eventually uh, accepted uh, this executive, accepted this government, and they decided that it would work with it. And probably the fact that it was sufficiently, uh, I would say, uh, far from uh, and protected from the influence of these various actors was one of the features that enabled it to be uh, successful. But at the same time, obviously, this is not just what was happening in Libya. It's not just a matter of um, diplomatic influence. It's also a matter of a military uh, influence, a military presence with boots on the ground uh, uh, inside the country. And as we know, Turkey is one of the countries, it's actually the only country that has an official you know, open presence uh, in Libya, while you know, Egypt and the UAE obviously have offered other types of assistance and Russia has private military contractors, so not a known official troops in this country. So uh, Turkey is reluctant, as I said to, before, to, to remove its uh, military presence from Libya. It wants uh, this to happen uh, in a manner that does not necessarily endanger its own interests uh, in, the, uh, in this country. And obviously, one of the, of the key interests that Turkey is trying to protect uh, in the new Libya is, uh, is also the, uh, this treaty, the maritime uh, uh, border definition uh, agreement that has not yet been ratified by the Lib Libyan parliament, which, by the way, is also unlikely ever to be ratified, at least by this parliament, because uh, it's actually controlled by forces that are, uh, I would say, antagonistic to Turkish, uh, to Turkish interests. So uh, it's clear here that one of the key drivers uh, of the stalemate in Libya and the transition and the uh, lack of clarity regarding the withdrawal of foreign forces and specifically of Turkish forces is also what will happen to An Ankara's interests in Libya in the, with the new government after the elections in December and so on and so forth. And this is something that obviously will need to be clarified and uh, I would say agreed on. Uh, by Turkey with the other regional actors and specifically Egypt. And that's where I think the Egypt-Turkey rapprochement comes into play and becomes extremely important because once Cairo and Ankara are able to reach some sort of understanding about their respective interests and respective agendas in the region, then it will become easier for Libya to move on in its transition, for, Turkish, for Turkey to withdraw its forces from, from the country, and also to clarify exactly the issue of the maritime borders, which, which remains obviously at the heart uh, of all of this. So as you can see, these, all these issues are extremely closely, uh, I would say, related, and it's impossible to solve just one of them in isolation from the others. They all need to be tackled, I would say, together for, for the Libyan transition and the Eastern Mediterranean issues to, to be able to move forward. Uh, another call for dialogue from Crisis Group, um, but uh, it's all inter interconnected, as you say, and uh, very, very important that they all be dealt with at the same time. We have another question, though, from Lambros Sirmos, uh, directed to Yanis, um, which is relation to the question of uh, the mediation of Germany, which has been such a, 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 a positive feature of uh, events in Turkey in, in recent years that Angela Merkel especially has, has, has proved to have such a constructive relationship uh, with the Turkish president. Um, but on the other hand, Greeks have uh, felt le left down and uh, I, I think Lambros Sirmos is, is one of them. Um, 
where do you think this has left Greek German, uh, Greek German relations, and is that a, a problem going forward, Yanis? Well, I need to highlight here that German Greek relations they suffered a lot over the last decade. So, anti-German feeling came to replace anti-American feeling that was quite dominant in Greece for many, many decades. And of course, this was linked to the financial crisis and the perceived role of Germany in that respect. Uh, I would like to highlight that there were some uh, like opinion leaders and a significant part of the Greek public opinion that were uh, thinking that Germany prioritized its own economic relations with Turkey over defending European norms or even Greek interests in that respect when it came to the uh, Greek-Turkish disputes over the Eastern Mediterranean, over the migration crisis and so on and so forth. And interestingly, that was one of the criticisms that the German government received within its borders too. So I think the Green Party was also very upset about the fact that Germany could strike deals with the Turkish government, regardless of the state of affairs of the human rights in, uh, in, within Turkey or other important domestic issues. I would like to highlight though here that for most European experts, and I would agree on that, I would see the two positions of France and Germany as complementary and not as contradicting each other. So in that respect, France would take a more, a more so a stronger position in defending Greece and Cyprus, and would even send military forces there. But Germany would keep a dialogue of communication open with Turkey and capitalize on this very important personal relationship that you mentioned, which I, in the beginning of my presentation, argued it was missing between the leaders of Greece and Turkey. So in that respect, I would see that the, all this work together and very importantly, there was a meeting of the South European leaders in Corsica, uh, in, with, in whose communique the leaders recognized German diplomatic efforts for de-escalation. So I would, I would prefer to see this as a part of the continuum and a part of the whole picture, and not as two countries, the two leading countries of the European Union trying to uh, compete against each other and leaving Greece other expectation of more support for leaving Greece disappointed because it doesn't get the support it expects. Thank you. Yes, very important these these contacts. And uh, while we're waiting for another question from the uh, the, the chat, uh, the Q and A on or on the YouTube channel, I'd like to just ask Charles Alinus about something which uh, 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 another aspect of the realism. One of the one of the most surprising projects to have emerged from the early 2011 enthusiasm 2012 was that a giant pipeline that was going to come from the far east of the Mediterranean to Europe. Um, it's still, I think, officially part of European policy to support this pipeline. Uh, is that really still on the cards? Is that anything that anybody really thinks will ever be built? Not really. I mean, the Eastman gas pipeline has always been a, a political tool. I mean, it's uh, Israel has been trying to get uh, access to or not access, uh, try to uh, increase its uh, influence in, in Europe, has been trying to find ways to get um, its gas exported, it came up with this idea, but it never it never was commercially viable. The pipeline not only is technically very challenging, but uh, to get the gas to Europe, it will take a price of about $8 per million BTU to make it commercially viable. Longer term prices in Europe are low, much lower than that. Russian gas can be sold to Europe at $4, either as uh, by pipeline or Novatec as LNG at $4 and still be profitable. This pipeline cannot compete. And now with the shift in Europe towards clean energy away from gas and the expectation that by the end of this decade, gas consumption in Europe will go down and beyond that uh, go down, down even more, uh, it doesn't justify this pipeline. It's not it's not likely to happen. So it continues to be part of the projects of common interest in terms of the EU having already approved it, continues to fund studies uh, on, the pipeline, on the pipeline. But the, you know, the challenge is to attract 
first of all, to find buyers for the gas in Europe, because without buyers on the, from the gas, for the gas from in Europe, they, they cannot happen. And then uh, attract the investment required, which will be eight to $10 billion. The, where is that going to come from? The EU is not going to build the pipeline and neither is, you, is the US. So who is going to put the money? I mean, after all these years, we, this pipeline idea has been in existence for 10 years. If it was such a hot thing, why the oil companies operating in the region, why didn't they jump onto the bandwagon and uh, invest in the pipeline and make it happen? After all, they will benefit by exporting their gas to Europe. The reason they haven't shown any interest is because it's, it's not commercially viable. It's as simple as that. So politically, it's a good, a good thing to, to pursue. And it has uh, indirect benefits. It brought uh, Israel, Cyprus, and Greece together um, into an alliance uh, around the pipeline. It attracted huge political interest, huge support from Europe and the United States. But that's all political. Politics alone don't make pipelines happen. That's a fascinating insight. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Yes, I, it, uh, it, it's amazing how these, these uh, projects take on virtual lives of their own. We have no further questions from the floor, but I have, uh, I think I would like to turn to Alyssa just to, to wrap up all that we've discussed. We've, um, you talked to uh, Alyssa of, of um, some skepticism in the EU about how, how long this relative lull and po positive direction in the East Mediterranean uh, could last. But you've also talked about a convergence in the EU. And we've heard from uh, Ricardo that, the, uh, uh, that there's a, uh, a sense that uh, France and Germany are, 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 are uh, uh, sorry, Yanis, that uh, France and Germany are uh, in some respects uh, uh, playing two, two, two parts in the, from the same score. Uh, do you think that there are, um, there, there's a will in the European Union to, sort, to at least sort out a joint position that, they, that there are things it could do? And, and if so, what would those things uh, be that you think that they should do? Is the East Mediterranean Forum something? Is there, is there something else that Europe can do to, uh, to keep the current uh, uh, lack of tension uh, on going on for, for the, for longer. Thanks, Hugh. Um, I, I'm not sure I can wrap up everything we've discussed, but I can certainly try to draw some points from, from this very rich discussion. Um, in terms of, I mean, the, the good cop, bad cop, Germany, France, um, I don't know if that was intentional, but certainly that's the way in a larger sense uh, the EU policy has been formed of carrot and stick um, with respect to Turkey. Um, I think now, you know, where with the tensions um, starting early last year, especially over Cyprus, and then um, sort of expanding um, with the crisis with Greece over the summer, um, there was a there was a lot more debate um, and and all of these different interests that I talked about, you know, fears over migration, fears about losing a strategic ally within NATO, these different um, sort of considerations that uh, that different. EU member states rank in different ways when it comes to Turkey. Um, but certainly the, 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 this idea of a phased proportionate and reversible kind of approach to, to Turkey, it, it has been reaffirmed in the last um, European Council. I think, you know, part of the problem is how um, the EU can deliver on that because a lot of the aspects don't have to do with anything we really talked about during this last hour. They have to do with, you know, economic reforms in Turkey. They have to do with um, different, different aspects of the way that the EU uh, structures those, uh, those sort of like customs union reform is based on a whole bunch of things that don't have to do with our, our discussion about geopolitics or about you know, uh, ships in, in contested waters. So, so that's a difficulty um, going forward, but you know, I, I think, um, and some might disagree that you know, it's useful to at least compartmentalize the sort of interest-based cooperation and the values-based criticism to try to maintain, um, you know, a, a working relationship um, with um, Turkey. And then I think another thing that's interesting is, you know, what Charles was just speaking about, you know, this EastMed gas pipeline, it's political, it's, a, you know, there are these different, and that's just an example, but uh, of 
these sort of flash points, um, if you were, and some of them are, are in, in unnecessary or not backed up by the economics or by the reality um, behind it. And, and I think it would be useful for, you know, um, especially with transatlantic cooperation to kind of put these things back into perspective and, you know, um, say, you know, more clearly, um, the US and the EU could say more clearly, um, despite the fact that this has been a source of cooperation for Israel, Greece and Cyprus, um, to, to also acknowledge that maybe this is not, um, there are other alternatives or better alternatives to, you know, the longest, deepest pipeline in the world to, to, to get gas from the region uh, to Europe and that, you know, that you should sort of explore some of those things. Also maybe exploring the idea um, of including Turkey in some of these groups like the Eastman Gas Forum. We talked about all the reasons why that's, you know, um, extremely difficult. Um, but, you know, I think working towards that goal, um, you know, of Turkey becoming an observer maybe with some kind of conditional membership in the longer term um, would be a way to reduce uh, tensions. But I mean, of course, as we said, there's some skepticism and at least from the EU perspective, when, when talking about Turkey, you have sort of a, a spectrum of what uh, concrete steps uh, different EU member states would like to see for you know, proof that, uh, that Turkey is going to uh, be a more constructive partner, I guess. And that goes all the way to you know, withdrawing troops from Libya. So then you get back into this knot of regional issues that are, that are very different from, from um, from from just you know these very specific um, EU Turkish relationships, I don't know if that that brings in some of the aspects we talked about. It, it does indeed. Thank thank you, Alyssa. And we have one question. Uh, we have just time for from Jochen de Hoop, um, and uh, it's the question is how would the pushbacks in the Aegean Sea fit into the dispute between Turkey and Greece? That's the refugees pushbacks of refugees who are trying to reach Greek islands mostly but sometimes over the rivers uh, in Thrace um, and they are being pushed back. Um, uh, how is that affecting the Turkey-Greece um, uh, things? Berkay, can I uh, ask you to, to have a go at that? Yes, sure. I mean, we've seen um, some tensions also recently uh, between coast guards of the two countries in the seas. Um, you know, of course, right now, so there is a diplomatic sort of, uh, the uh, diplomacy is sort of in the forefront in Turkey and Greece. So we're, we're, when times are more conducive to talking, then it's uh, easier to sort of dismiss these smaller scale incidents and um, go past them. Um, and we've seen that, you know, before that there were in dog fights when a fighter jet uh, was downed, you know, because politicians were quite openly sort of um, not making a big um, um, issue around that. Um, it didn't turn into a big issue. But of course, you know, these small incidents also at times when, you know, there was, um, uh, when the situation was more fragile, also turned into a bigger uh, escalation or were at least the precursors of uh, uh, more steps towards escalation. So I think it's important uh, to watch that and to, to be mindful of sort of um, how this uh, cooperation that the EU is designing right now on migration, how, is, how that is going to be reframed to also reduce sort of the risks of more people crossing through the Aegean. Um, and I guess that's, uh, you know, what role will Frontex assume in that sense and what roles will um, the Coast Guards of the two countries uh, be asked to assume on that front? So I think, um, you know, uh, I don't see it as a sort of big flashpoint that could uh, push the sides towards uh, something more dangerous. Uh, right now at least, but I think it's still something that needs to be watched. And you know, this re the recent the, what, uh, escalation that happened, not escalation, but the, the, the clash between two Coast Guards a month ago, I think was testimony for the fact that this is sort of an issue that needs to be closely watched. Thanks, Yanis. Very briefly, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, let me add to this the negative effect of the pandemic. Due to the pandemic, low level contacts and civil society contacts have come to zero, especially on the coast on the Eastern Aegean Islands and the Western Turkish coast. So this has had a negative effect on cooperation communication that may have contributed to such incidents. So hopefully with a, a recession of the pandemic, we'll be able to recover this uh, contacts and improve collaboration on sensitive issues like the migration question.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Alyssa, for wrapping, wrapping things up uh, on, the, on the high scale as well. Um, I, I have to say I'm, I'm encouraged slightly by the tone of the discussion. We, haven't, we, we talked about tensions in the title of this, uh, this session, but there's actually been more about politics and, and, and possibilities for, uh, for improvements ahead. So uh, I hope we can hold this moment and uh, foster it. And uh, I thank you, Berkai, Charles, Yanis, and Alyssa very much for your interventions. And uh, I will say goodbye to our audience as well. Thank you for listening in. Listening in. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.